Hello, everyone. This is Felicia Bell from the Gulf States Regional Office located in Jackson, Mississippi. We welcome you today to the weekly Wednesday workshop. Um, we're so glad to have you. And today we have a special guest, Guy Ames, and he's from the Southeast Office. Hopefully I said that correctly. I always say Arkansas Office. Um, and he is our go-to person for fruit and nut trees. So if you have questions, please, please refer them to God now, but also send him emails. He loves this. And so guy eats, sleep, drink, nut and fruit trees. <laughs> and Pretty close. So, <laughs> he loves it. And so we welcome, that's what NCAT is here for. We want to assist farmers around the country with sustainable methodologies, techniques, systems. That's what we're here for. So if we run out of time, please, please, we will definitely share our email address at the end. And definitely you can drop uh, some questions to us at a later date or give us a call. And we always want to let you know that we we all are working remotely, so please let the phone ring for numerous of times so it can reach our personal phones um, because I have noticed some people have cut off uh, before I can actually answer. So we definitely are taking calls if you would just let it ring um, more than a couple of times. So at this time, Guy, I would love for you to introduce yourself. And I have always wanted to know this. How did you get into loving fruit trees and nut trees? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, that's not a simple answer. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll just be perfectly honest. Uh, I am a back to the land hippie. And uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, I did my time in the military, too. But I was a, uh, an anti-war activist. And uh, it got so bad, you know, in the late 60s and 70s that I wanted to escape uh, what was going on. And so there are a bunch of us that decided we were going to move out to the woods, you know, and, <laughs> and try to grow our own shooting shoestrings and our own dental floss. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine how that turned out. But somewhere in there, you know, so really initially it was actually, I would say, a political decision to uh, kind of drop out and try to do something outside of the system. Uh, and then I just fell in love with it. Of course, it didn't do any good to drop out of the system anyway. And uh, <laughs> yeah. then I just kind of gradually uh, fell in love with trees, especially because it seemed like the right thing to do to grow something that you didn't have to plow and disturb the soil. Uh, part of that was because I was in the Ozarks of Arkansas and we got very thin soils, very erodible soils. But just in general, you know, tillage is not particularly good for the soil, and and uh, and I just love trees, so I just kind of got suckered into that, and and uh, still am. I'm 68 now. This has been a long time ago that this started. Uh, so I've had a lot of failures, and to whatever degree I failed, that's what's made me an expert, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and then we talked about on last week. I'm trying to. Not, not say mistakes anymore. I want to okay. say lessons. That's me only. I'm only speaking for myself because farming is that. And, and I always say it out loud for our guests mm -hmm. uh, and our future clients here because that is what farming is. We're going to have those lessons and however you define it, if you said mistake or mishap, um, it's okay. That is yeah. your learning experience, and I bet you money you won't do it that way again. It may <laughs> pop up 10 years later, but <laughs> you definitely won't do it again. Very good. And so they are lessons, and so we're grateful that you learned about fruit trees and nut trees because that is something definitely do during our crisis mode, what we're in right now, Fruit trees and nut trees definitely could be one of those pivotal operations that we can start. So if you didn't have fruit and nut trees, you definitely can do that this fall and start getting into that to have another stream of income. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. 
That is so great. So we're going to get started with our questions. I want to let everyone know that's coming in. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. And then at the end, if we have enough time, I can open it up where you can actually uh, speak your question if you would like. Um, so our first question is, why should a producer add fruit and nut trees now to their operation? The easy answer is because they sell. They really okay. do. So I'm a member of the Fayetteville Farmers Market, and uh, we've got a point system to who can get on the market. It's actually a crowded market now. It's very popular, uh, a lot of customers, but we have a point system. Uh, and that point system, you know, how much money did you make last year gets you on the market this year, that kind of stuff. For fruit Ooh. growers, they fudge that. <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One is because we don't have a crop or much of a crop some years because of late freezes and things like that. And the other reason that they, they'll fudge on that and let you in when maybe, you know, bump someone that really should be money wise ahead of you is because fruit sales and it's hard to grow. A lot of it is hard to grow. Uh, so if you can bring a crop in, they want you at that farmer's market. They want and they will let you in and I will sell generally just sell fruit hand over fist. The other main marketing channel that I have is uh, Ozark Natural Foods, which is a oh, yes. sound, what it sounds like, you know, yes. a health food store. And uh, they only accept certified naturally grown or certified organic uh, grown fruit. So that works out great for me because I'm certified naturally grown and they will take basically everything that I can bring to their dock and you know I'll drop it off and I get good prices very good prices and uh, send me the check in the mail that's great that <laughs> so is that's great. the answer to that is that it's is that it sells people gotcha. won't it's a sweet thing it's it's sweet everybody loves sweets yes. but it's good for you it's Good a healthy point. sweet, yes, <laughs> a natural sweet, like you say. So yeah. you mentioned that they are usually hard to grow. So do you mind sharing, and I, I know it's oh, probably hundreds of varieties, but what would be your go-to varieties in both fruit and nut for the Southeast, like where we okay. are? Um, and, and we apologize for any guests on here that's not in the Southeast, but again, you can... You can email a guy and, and get those varieties right. for your area. Right. Uh, so first I'll mention that these are written down in a, a, our publications, our ATRA publications. So I've got one called uh, uh, Fruit Trees, Nuts and Bushes for uh, Natural Growing in the Ozarks. And that has a lot of the varieties, you know, pears and apples that you can grow uh, and then unusual species. But let me say to begin with, uh, that one of the major impediments, especially to those farmers that have to make some money at this, mm -hmm. is that these are perennials and they take a while to get going. Yes. So the nature of them being perennials, meaning year after year, is that you have to make some choices at the start. You know, what is going to grow? And because that's an excellent question that you asked, because if you start with the wrong stuff, it's really hard to change. If you're growing vegetables and you uh, end up mm -hmm. with a you know bad variety next year or maybe even later in the season, you can plant a new one. With some of these fruit trees, you're going to have a three or four year you know span before anything even starts ripe or you know, bearing. So you've got to make some good choices up front, and uh, and then you have to be able to you know you're not going to be bringing in money from those things for three or four years either. Mm -hmm. So there's those two are are really uh, connected and pretty foundational uh, importance. Great, great. So I always have wondered, the, is it the dwarf fruit trees? Are those really good to grow? And, and I, don't, I, I don't know if commercially, but even homesteaders, are they really something that we should be looking at? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, we get it a lot here. Uh, at Atra. And uh, so the really only reliably dwarf uh, fruit trees to begin with are apples and cherries. And let me give you a, a, a clue to the answer. And that's that most of the apple rootstocks have been developed in England or upstate New York. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not our part of the world. 
And most of the cherry rootstocks have been developed in Switzerland and Germany and Russia. Okay. Not our part of the yeah. world. So my experience has been both research. Uh, I do have a master's in, in this topic from the University of Arkansas and then you know, all this all this experience. And uh, my experience and education has been that in this part of the world, uh, if you treat those dwarf apples and cherries like mm, a prized rose bush or an orchid, yes, <laughs> it might work for you. But as somebody's trying to make money, that's probably not going to work too well. Okay. So one of the things with the apples, a good, uh, it turns out that a, a good uh, compromise are the semi-dwarfing apple rootstocks. So by the way, the, the dwarfing is in the rootstock. All fruit trees, you know, are really two trees in one. You've got a rootstock that you can choose in many cases for soil conditions or uh, you, by your question, you know, uh, dwarfing or full size. And it turns out the dwarfs, the full dwarfs just don't do that well in the South. Uh, but some of the semi dwarfs will and uh, Standards, of course, will often make it just fine, you know, full size. Basically, it's a rootstock that was grown from seed, but they're big and they take even longer to come into bearing. So one of the big advantages of dwarfing rootstock is to bring a, a, a tree into bearing. But if it dies before it can, do, <laughs> it hasn't done you much good. So make that compromise and, and get semi-dwarfing where they're available. A lot of other fruit trees, even though you'll see them in nurseries that say, you know, dwarf pear or dwarf peach, it's baloney. Uh, it's it's a. I'm a nurseryman on the side, and it's embarrassing to me that there's other nurserymen that do this. Uh, but it's just a lie. I just got to say, there's mm -hmm. no dwarf peach. You don't need a dwarf peach. You can dwarf it by pruning it and stuff. So, okay. anyway, d shy away from the full dwarfs. Excellent question. Try good, to stay good. away from the full dwarfs in the south. Great. I've always wanted to know that because <laughs> yep. you see a lot more now uh, in your nurseries and stuff and and yep. a lot of people that really don't want to be a full blown farm or, mm -hmm. or big garden. They get that. Um, so that's maybe good they can get away that. with it. Yes. Yeah, yes maybe they yes. can get away with it. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. what is the value to a farmer to start managing what they have for a profitable outcome. So these are farmers that have fruit and nut trees now. So what would be, you know, what's the value to a farmer to start managing it now? And they may have just let it grow over the years. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's really another good question because if you can, if you've already got those uh, on your place and you've already, uh, I'm going to imagine that they're already four or five years old, at least, mm -hmm. you know, they're already bearing, you've got that four or five year wait period over. Anybody that's starting fresh with a new tree, uh, they're gonna have to wait at least four or five years before something starts bearing and, and providing returns. If you've already got a fruit or nut tree on your place, then you're way ahead of the game. Now, if you're in the South and you already have fruit and nut trees on your place, you're already aware that there's uh, bugs and diseases that are just lined up waiting <laughs> to get to that fruit. So. <laughs> You got it, but you know something already. That's good. So you're going to have to do something to uh, help. There's a few exceptions to that, and we can talk about that as we get into it. A few uh, oddball, but still marketable fruits like pawpaws. I actually make money off of pawpaws. Mm, okay. uh, and they have virtually no pests, but that's a real oddity. Everything else is going to have pests. There's one other fruit that's a native fruit, too, like the pawpaws, that I'm pretty big on for the South. And can be grown organically, and that's muscadines. Yes. <laughs> I love them. They sell like crazy, and you can grow them organically. We know it. Um, yes. I can't remember the name of the woman that was on the board of Southern Sog, and I know you were on the board, Felicia, for years. So she was from Florida, and she had a big organic muscadine thing. It might have even been before your time. Okay. But she had she made wine. Yeah. But she was a muscadine farmer. Muscadine, wow. organic, certified organic muscadine. And to grow organic fruit in the South, um, it's tough. And, and muscadines are one of those things you can do at Popeyes too. But these other ones, you know, pecans would be something, mm -hmm. you know, might find on homesteads and such. And uh, I don't really know. I haven't talked to you ahead of time, Felicia. But, you know, my experience in Arkansas is when we find um, pecans, you know, around in, in either cityscapes or occasionally out in the countryside. Mm-hmm. 
they are those nuts hardly ever fill out because of the pecan weevil. And if you think yes. about the mm -hmm, if you think about the native range of the pecan uh, in the Texas otherwise dry parts of Texas, the the creeks and the river bottoms, they get water because it's so low. But they don't have a lot of hickories around and other nut trees around. You know, we've got so many hickories in the wild, and it would be the same for y'all in Mississippi, it'd be my guess. Yes. yes that yes. you're going to have serious problems. So even though there's pecans around, eh, that might be a hard one to tame. But these other fruit trees, you know, if you've got a problem, if you've got fruit trees already there and you're just having uh, some problems bringing in a, a, a marketable crop because of pests and diseases, Let's talk about it here or, you know, contact me at Atra because it's probably going to be a detailed answer. But yes, but of course, we can do something with that. And that will help you. That will give you a big head start on that four or five year wait. Otherwise, if you're starting from scratch. Got you. One of the questions I want to ask, because um, this is a discussion and we really get into our own even management, like our own farms and stuff. So this is going to be my farm question. Uh, my and I never knew why. So my grandfather planted pecan cedar, pecan cedar. So he did it for oh, no over 100 feet. It's 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 the whole row of that. <laughs> and so, do you think the purpose of doing that was to help? Because they they always produce. Um, so we did we do have the weevils, but they don't take out all of them. We usually I was taught to burn them like we would just burn the <laughs> and so um what do you think cedar helps with some of the pests just because of the smell and and cedar is very powerful and, and have many benefits yeah i really don't know i've never heard that it <laughs> certainly isn't i say this it's not an alternate host for any pecan disease you know okay. there's uh, pears and apples cedar is an alternate host for, they call it cedar apple rust, but mm -hmm. there's nothing like that with pecans and there's no oh, wow. insect pest. So at the very least, all I can think, you said it was your dad or your granddad? No, my grandfather, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, it may have been a market for cedar posts and he was just taking up that space. I don't know, no. that's a new one for me. <laughs> Well, it's it's beautiful now. You know it is. It's wow. very beautiful having that. Um, but our notion on our farm was to he planted those so it could be the financial resources for us to get started. Wow. And so and it it worked out wow. the way he wanted. So we were able to sell pecans and we have Asian pears and figs. And that was our capital to start our farm. Fantastic. So his what a wishes, granddad. Yeah, his, wow. he got his wishes and we're very grateful because yeah, I didn't have to get a loan my first, you know, to start our farm and what have you. So I'm very grateful for that. But none of yeah, none of our fruit trees, nut trees I've had to plant. Um and oh, and we have persimmon. Um, but I did, I think I have like 35 to 40 blueberries this year I planted. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, now I got a three to four year wait, guys, but I'm, I'm yeah. excited. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's excited. funny you would do that list because that's pretty much what I had. Asian, Asian pears, persimmons, figs. Yeah, mm -hmm. for the South, you got the right ones. Your grandfather was a special guy. <laughs> And then my thing is, is trying to find it because the trees are older than I am. So we're we're talking about 60 plus years, some of these trees. And yeah. so I'm trying to replace the Asian pears and I, it's hard to find. And when I find they're very expensive. So yeah, yeah. why are some varieties, are, are they because they can be eaten right off the tree? Why are varieties, some varieties more expensive than others? Uh, you know, the, the simple answer again, of course, is just demand, you know, that somebody okay. really wants them. But, uh, you know, if you were in the right market, uh, like here, I've got a market for my jujubes. You probably mm. don't have a market for jujubes or no. you might be able to develop one, but you might yes. not. And I can sell the few jujubes I have at a really good price. So, you know, that's not an easy answer. 
Okay. Uh, now, while the trees are expensive, uh, is that what you're asking too? Yeah, because the, the Asian stuff. pears, you have certain pear varieties that are inexpensive, but then you also like the Asian pear, sometimes $25, $30 for one. And if yeah. you're trying to do this commercially, of course, you're going to need more than one. So I always have wondered why that particular variety is, is so expensive over the other yeah. pear varieties. Yeah, all I can guess is that is that out west, you know, where the, all the commercial uh, production uh, is centered, that there's certain varieties that are, you know, really uh, very marketable, easy for that system to work. And so they sell a lot of those fruit and uh, consequently they sell a lot of those trees. Uh, mm -hmm. I grow Asian pears too, and I also uh, grow and sell the trees. And, uh, you know, there's just a few varieties that have done well in the South. Most of them will just get eaten up bad with fire blight. So, yes. you know, that's really something right there. But because it's just these few varieties, uh, that's all I can guess is that it's just, you know, supply and demand, and it's just not the same demand um, out West as there is here. I don't know exactly. I will say though, that leads me to, a. a I'll ask my own question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just answer it. Uh, I started, I'm in the nursery business and, and mm -hmm. I actually make more money with selling the trees than I do with the fruit. I do both, oh. but the, my kind of backed into the nursery business by accident because I really wanted to grow tree fruits. And I did the same thing you just mentioned. I looked at the price of the individual trees and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't afford an acre of that. Yes. You know, I wanted two, three, four acres of it, and I knew I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I learned how to graft and bud. And then after I learned how to do that, I realized people really wanted those trees. And so that became, a, a at first, just an adjunct to my fruit business. And eventually, like now, it's a bigger part of my business. So I sell trees just locally, northwest Arkansas, but to, to home gardeners and to homesteader types. There's really no commercial fruit production in this part of the south, not yeah, not around here anyway, but yes. so that feels good and uh, saved a lot of money uh, mm -hmm. and, that I really just didn't have. So that's of one course. way. It's, it's a it's a it's a little tricky, but people with patience mm -hmm. and uh, a steady hand can learn how to do that. And uh, it's just great. there's really no secret. And again, I've got a Atra, uh, I've got a yeah. uh, an Atra pub. In this case, it's actually a webinar. Okay. I'm doing that with a lot of pictures, a lot of photos explaining everything, how to bud and graft. Great. So people might want to think about that. Save some money. Yes, yes. So I will give um, the, I don't think we have any callers, so I can type it in the chat. And then, Guy, we're going to get into questions from uh, some of our guests on with us now. So okay. one, the first question is, what varieties of pears, European and Asian, have y'all found to be most blight resistant? Mm -hmm. You want to start, Felicia? Now, I you, have, know the, you, you know I have no background on fruit and nut trees. Well, I was just wondering, since you had some Asian pears, you, of course, I don't, you, you may not I, find out from your grandfather what the varieties are. I, I don't. I know it's the Asian pear, but... Yeah. We now that the tree is older, we are having, and I'm assuming that is the blight because it, it's just getting an older tree. But yeah. when it was much younger, it was very vibrant, and we didn't have those issues. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know why. So the tree is surrounded by uh, fig trees, um, and also a canning pear tree is nearby. Oh. My okay. grandmother loved that tree. I, they're so small, but she loved uh -huh. that tree. Um, but the pears are just, oh my goodness, so small. But I don't know if that helped over the years. But like I said, now that it's gotten older, we are seeing. That's why I'm trying to replace it before yeah. it actually dies. Yeah. Well, the okay. Then so the answer to that question then about pears, European and Asian, uh, is hard to to answer. Uh, without knowing exactly where these people are, uh, but I'll, I'll answer the question in a general way. Uh, the further south you go, the worse the fire blight, fire blight question is, uh, or pressure rather, uh, the worse that it gets. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because heat and humidity, heat and rainfall are so important in the 
in the uh, uh, etiology of the disease. So here I'm in the upper south. You know, I'm in, in, in the hills, too. So it's a, okay. a little cooler, um, uh, probably better air circulation overall, that kind of thing. So I can grow a, a few varieties of Asian pears, really two of the main ones, Shinko and Korean Giant. Mm. And there's another one that's really a European Asian cross, but it, it, it resembles an Asian much more than a European type. And it's called Turnbull, Turnbull, one word, Turnbull. And it's a pretty new one, at least on the market. It's not really a new pair. It comes from the 1960s, but but it's just now uh, catching on. So those are really the only three. I've tried a lot of Asian pears, and almost all of them have succumbed to fire blight. There is one more that I, I, I picked up from Alabama A&M many years ago, <laughs> and that was called Siri, and not the, not the voice on your <laughs> – this one is spelled S-E-U-R-I. Now, it has a tendency to bloom too early, so I don't get a crop every year. But when I get a crop, it is magnificent. Wow. They're just big as softballs and have this, you know, tastes kind of like a banana, but it's crunchy. Oh, it, wow. It, it, it's amazing. All right. So now back to the European pears. So, again, in the Upper South, you're going to do better. The USDA at Beltsville, Maryland, which is almost the South, a lot mm -hmm. of similar conditions. They had a breeding program for years. So, uh, a lot of the, the pears that came out of there, uh, Magnus, Maxine, Potomac, um, there's a few others. Those are the ones I mostly grow and have kind of uh, have made it through some really bad fire blight years. There are the old canning pears, like you mentioned, kefir, and further south, pineapple. Mm -hmm. There is a, a Facebook group called uh, uh, Southern Pear Interest Group. And uh, let's see, there's one from Florida called Florida Home. Now, okay. you know, if you tried to put these up against some of these European uh, gourmet pears, they wouldn't hold up, you know, fresh-wise, they wouldn't hold up in a competition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got you. But, but the one, a couple from, from Beltsville will. Um, yeah, that Potomac is really good. Magnus is, can be out of this world. It, I'd put it up against any of those fancy French pears. But don't, in general, in the South, don't plant anything with a name that sounds Frenchy. You know, no okay. Camis, no Danjou, none of that stuff, because it will melt with fire blood. With the, oh, wow. And <laughs> this question did come from, uh, she is located in Birmingham, Alabama. So okay. she may be able to use the Siri uh, since yeah. it comes uh -huh. from, yeah, that, that may yeah. work right for her. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for that question. Yeah. So let let me jump to another one. All right. So this one is the jujubes. Am I pronouncing it correctly? As far as I know. <laughs> so they have jujubes <laughs> and a question mark. Do any of you know anyone growing them commercially? I don't. Okay. So that's, that's a really, that's a good question. And I guess you could say commercially I do since I sell some, yes, but yes. it doesn't amount to a whole lot. And, you know, I just yes. have a few trees and it's just a, you know, I, I live in a university town, you know, University of Arkansas is here. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of Asian Americans here. There's a lot of professors, Asian professors at the university, and they'll come and they'll get real excited when they see those jujubes and I can sell them like crazy. They really, they take our heat well, uh, they'll take drought well, uh, I don't know exactly what to do with them. Uh, I, they taste good fresh. It's not my favorite fresh, but they're good. Uh, but they're, I know they're used in Chinese medicine. Uh, they're the candy, the jujube candy that used to be in movie theaters. Some of you will remember that. Uh, <laughs> apparently, it really was used to be made from jujube syrup. You would cook them down and make a syrup out of them, and, they, and they'd make mm. this candy. So uh, you probably want to consult an Asian cookbook or something to figure out more what to do with these. But uh, so, yeah, I don't know anybody really commercially. There are some people in California uh, doing it. I hear in New mm -hmm. Mexico, there's a tiny bit of research going on, I think, in New Mexico State. But Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Next question is, do you know anyone growing sweet cherries in high tunnels? And if so, what have they learned about managing them? Okay. Excellent question. Uh, again, I have a publication at ATRA, 
And so if you'll go to that ATRA site, which I'm, I don't know if it's posted, but it's ATRA.org. You can get there by just going ATRA.org. And uh, there's one on cherries, including sweet cherries and including uh, uh, undercover, you know, in high tunnels. And uh, so I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that there's really only a, a couple of species, apples and cherries, that have consistent um, dwarfing rootstocks, dwarfing rootstocks that perform, you know, well consistently and so that's how you'd start with uh if you're going to try to grow them in high tunnels because sweet cherries otherwise are a very big uh, tree they get quite large mm -hmm. so you you get one of these dwarfing rootstocks and uh there's some little tricks you know when you're growing stuff in high tunnels uh cherries for instance you've got to have pollination so you have to actually uh buy these bumblebee colonies but you can get them you can buy uh, bumblebee colonies online and put them in your in your uh, uh, hoop house uh, to do the pollinating of the crop and then mm -hmm. of course you have to do everything else you normally do in a hoop house you got to provide irrigation fertilizer and everything else but mm -hmm. it can be done and it's actually being done at a commercial level let okay. me say real quickly though sweet cherries outside of a hoop house in the south is just a bust oh, wow. you can grow tart cherries in a lot of the south it's actually different species of sweet cherries but a true sweet cherries in the south are just not gonna not gonna cut it. Okay. But high Thank tunnels. you so much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And again, if you have, oh, I'm sorry, we do have another question. I have an apricot tree that will put on fruit, but I've never harvested a single fruit because they winter and rot on the tree before they get ripe. I have tried neem oil, but nothing has helped. I am using organic practices. Yeah. Stone fruit, stone fruit in the south. All these, all the stone fruits, you know, are the ones with the pits. So apricot, plums, peaches, cherries, and with the exception again of tart cherries, trying to do them organically is really difficult. And sulfurs, you're going to be your best bet. Some kind of sulfur compound, and you'll want to start spraying at about petal fall because that's when infection starts a lot. The infection period. This is one of the the tricks about these tree fruits, especially uh, stone fruits is that when you see something about to rot it's too late okay <laughs> you've already missed your spray period so you've got to start way at the way at the front of that it, i will say this if you've got an apricot that sets fruit you're doing pretty good especially if it's by itself so you've got something special but you're probably going to, have to spray sulfur probably every couple of weeks uh, starting mm -hmm. just at petal fall oh wow yeah and... not, a, not not fun oh wow so the, i may they may have to add a little bit more to this question, but it was asking, what is the range for apricots? Do you know what that means? The I range? Yes. Are they talking about varieties? Uh, I think they mean the geographical range probably, oh, but okay. yeah, I'm just guessing. But uh, so sometimes this happens that you get a clue uh, about um, the range of a fruit by its uh Latin binomial, so it's Prunus armeniaca. The apricot is Armeniaca, Armenia. So that's like present-day Iran and Iraq. It's mm. dry, it's dry and cool. They grow them in the mountains. So uh, apricot's native range is even the foothills of the Himalayas. Wow. So the South again is really kind of tough on apricots. Jersey cot. There's one from New Jersey from Rutgers University called Jersey cot. That's probably your best bet, uh, but it's uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't put your money in apricots in the I south. Guess. Okay. Yeah. It's just hard to grow here because of our heat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So and humidity, I, the heat and humidity. We could probably deal with just the heat if that's all it was. If it was dry. Oh wow. Okay. If it was dry heat, it would be good. But it's just oh wow. I didn't yeah. realize that. Okay. Yeah. That's well, look, wild. the commercial production in the United States is New Mexico and Southern California. Okay. Right okay. in there. Uh, we're doing our best. So I, I like hey, you said, muscadines. <laughs> muscadines is, is a, <laughs> muscadines, and I think plums, guy. We we're yeah. we could we could grow some plums. <laughs> really? Okay, good deal. So I think that may be our fruit in the south. We may not yeah. could touch other stuff. All right. Yeah. Last question I think I have from our participants. Do you have any pest problems? or cultural challenges with the jujube? 
Oh, uh, uh, virtually none. Uh, oh. I had one problem last year and never seen it before. Uh, but right before harvest of one variety, the biggest variety, which is Lee or Lang, and I'm getting that confused. I think it was Lee, L-I, and it rained right before, you know, I was ready to pick them and they cracked just like a lot of fruit will, you know, apples and, and tomatoes, cantaloupes, you know, <laughs> just a big deluge right before harvest and the fruit cracked. Other than that, oh, and the deer, of course, will nibble on the young, on the young trees, but no, they're really pretty carefree. Wow. All yeah. right, got it. Maybe something yeah. I have to grow now. <laughs> I got to look into the jujube. Yeah. And I have seen that variety, you know, when you're thumbing through yeah. the, the catalogs and stuff. Right. And I didn't realize we could grow it here in the South. I used to think that it was going to be, because it's kind of from another arid area, okay. uh, Southwest China. And I thought it was going to be that maybe our soils would be too wet, but they haven't seemed to have any problem with that. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up like moving into how does fruit and nut trees help our landscape for as like soil and water? Because we're we always talk about just that the ecosystem, the sustainability of whatever we put on our land. So how does it benefit us as as farmers? Well, the biggest thing is just not having to plow, you know, uh, there's some some big, big picture thinkers, you know, like Wendell Berry and, and mm -hmm. Wes Jackson. And those people say, you know, right now, about 10 percent of our food or calories comes from trees and bushes and 90 percent comes from annual crops, you know, corn, soybeans, blah, blah, blah. And they said, really, for long term sustainability of the culture of the human race, <laughs> we need yes. to switch that around. Because uh, worldwide, the biggest uh, challenge to sustainability is still soil erosion. Yes. So that's it. That, right in a nutshell, you know, there it is. I, I always like to throw this out, too, to, to people who might be vegetarians or vegans or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. not, by the way. But I love <laughs> fruit. And uh, fruit, if you think about it, it's the only plant product, the only ag product that wants to be eaten. Yes. Yeah. The okay. fruit, that seed, needs to be spread so the tree is producing something that is delectable and attractive for woolly mammoths, us, whatever, mm -hmm. to eat yes. and spread the seed around. So, you know, they, they're chock full of, of good stuff, you know, sugars and vitamins and everything, because that's the deal. One other last thing besides, you know, not eroding the soil and... and uh, uh, the moral thing <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> that you're not eating something that doesn't want to be eaten and that's that most of these tree fruits don't require very many inputs i mean now we're, when you tr start to grow something outside of its range like uh maybe the peaches and apricots and stuff like that you got to use pesticides but uh for the most part the the fruit itself even though it's super good for you the sugars, uh, the vitamins, all that stuff comes from photosynthesis. That just comes mm -hmm. from the sun. Mm -hmm. The carbon that's in the wood, you know, that you prune off and you go, well, that just comes from the air. That's carbon dioxide. Yes. And, you know, uh, and then water. The fruits, you know, 90, 95 percent water. And uh, so really, and you look at, uh, you know, you look at alternative uh, crops, you know, uh, uh, cotton and soybeans and, you know, all the big row crops, they're heavy feeders, corn. Oh my gosh. You know, you got to pump the nitrogen to them. You just have to do that trees. They, they mostly get what they want out of the, out of sunlight and air. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. That is Isn't so cool? amazing. And that's why they're good for us. Like all, <laughs> yep. everything out there is just so tasty. And I would just ask, everyone to start planting put a fruit tree you know uh on your place because it's it's just phenomenal and and just the if you have children and grandchildren that's just something they would enjoy to pick and and then of course create a little income for them to do it at a sale at a farmer's market so I just have always loved fruit trees um, just because one of the things I have always done, God, when I'm out there working, that mm -hmm. those Asian pears, oh, my mm -hmm. goodness, that would be my breakfast. 
and yeah. right now it's the figs and like you said all animals they look i have to fight <laughs> and not literally i have to give that just <laughs> not literally but they they will fly so close to my head to make me leave the fig tree and i'm like I'm not afraid of you. And so they eventually yeah. leave me alone, but they like, we don't want you to eat it. We want to eat it. We so want to eat it. Yeah. Every single year because we we have an abundance of figs. Uh yeah. and so yeah, I'll, we we and I was always taught by my grandfather, we're growing in nature. And so at least 10% and sometimes 20% has to go back to nature. So you cannot fight with nature because it those animals love that food just like we love it so we have to share uh and i know all people don't believe that but we're out there in nature so what do you expect (laughs) that's right there it is the proof is in the pudding right there yes yes so we do have uh some more questions so it's asked could you talk a little bit more about the pawpaw productions the best cultivars yeah uh, so, uh, let me say first, if we don't get very far, again, we got a publication at ATRA, mm-hmm. uh, but Kentucky State University up in Frankfurt is doing really the first, um, really institutional research, you know, ever, uh, and coming up with some really good stuff, including good cultivars, you know, varieties and such. Was that the question specifically? Yes, because they varieties? wanted you to talk more about it, but then, yes, could you share the best cultivars? Okay, so uh, one of the things I'll say to start with is that uh, there are some really amazing cultivars, uh, and it's probably best to start with cultivars, you know, to start with grafted trees, make sure that you get the a name variety, because there are some off flavors in pawpaws. There's a, oh, maybe five, possibly 10% of people don't, they find something objectionable about a pawpaw, a little aftertaste. Well, they've identified, the researchers at Kentucky State identified what that aftertaste is. Uh, I can't remember, it's a pinene or something, but anyway, it's objectionable to a lot of people. And they're breeding against that. They're choosing things that don't have that aftertaste. So when you go to get something from the wild, if you get a pawpaw from the wild, if the first one you don't like, try another one, not off the same tree, but a different pawpaw. You're going to find one you just think is delectable because they can be so good. Uh, I, uh, mm. But uh, so the cultivars are the safest way. But let me also say that if you were to find uh, a fruit that you really like, save those seed because unlike a lot of other fruit trees, pawpaws come up pretty true to seed. So you could plant a seed and and count on getting fruit that's very likely to be as good as the one you ate that that seed came from. So don't hesitate to do that. And uh, it may not be the biggest fruit. It may not be maybe the best tasting one. But oh, for my my taste, almost every pawpaw is good. They're from good to excellent. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so let's get back to the the actual answer to that question. Then so cultivars. There's two that have come out of Kentucky State, uh, and one of them's called Atwood, and it's really yummy. And another one called Benson, and the new one, Benson, is uh, that's her latest uh, release, and it's almost round. And the the uh, advantage of that, besides being just different, uh, is that there's more flesh. If you open up a pawpaw, you'll see there's quite a bit of seed in there. A lot of the weight of the whole thing is in seed. And uh, so uh, a round one uh, has the same amount of seed, but a lot more flesh. And then the other varieties that are really good came out from Neil Peterson. We we call him the Mahatma Papa because (laughs) isn't that great? The Mahatma Papa. I know. I love that. (laughs) He kind of brought the Papa into the 21st century here. He's really uh, uh, just dedicated his life to the Papa, frankly. And um, so. He's been a breeder and a selector from the wild, and almost all the pawpaws with the names of uh, eastern rivers, uh, Potomac, I know I've already mentioned that as a pair, but it's a pawpaw too, so Potomac pawpaw, mm-hmm. Shenandoah, Susquehanna, um, Rappahannock, 
all these that are kind of named after rivers are, are Peterson Pawpaws and really good. Okay. There's a couple of older ones. There's one from Kansas of all places uh, called uh, Sunflower that's really good too. Wow. But anyway, there's some good varieties out there. Go to get our get the get the Atra Pub. It'll give you a really good introduction, I think. And then if you want more detail, then go to Kentucky State. Uh, just you know, type in Kentucky State and Pawpaws, and you'll you'll be deluged with good info. <laughs> with all the information. That's amazing. Our next question. Um, so they're saying, could you repeat some of the resources mentioned? So I think I can answer that. If you could go to our ATRA page, our publication, all of these answers are in Guy's publication on our ATRA website. And so I have put the link in the chat. Um, definitely, I could type it back in again but please please and as of now all of our publications are free if uh you did not know that and so please check out our publications we have oh my goodness a wealth of information on our website to assist you um and not just pubs so webinars and podcasts and all sorts of things and of course video uh on our youtube channel but you can find all of that at our website the atra NCAT atra.ncat.org that is the site so um please if 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 i'm answering your question correctly you can find these resources um in, within our publication or webinar i know guy mentioned a webinar that he did as well so um next question is i i know i mentioned about the success of plums are you not having any problems with plum kirky kirky Loy? Yeah, uh, curculio. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry I, I messed that up. <laughs> yeah, so Felicia may have, I, you may have a better answer to this because, well, I'm an organic grower. Mm -hmm. So the plump curculio has been really, really a hard thing to, to control organically. Uh, the There's a there's a clay product, kale and clay, uh, which is the same clay they use in kaopectate. Oh, wow. I mentioned this because it's safe. And yes. in toothpaste, it's the same clay as in toothpaste. Uh, it's very, it's very safe, and uh, they grind it to a certain grind, and then you can spray it on the trees, and it uh, repels most insects, including the plum curculio. Uh, but the problem is, is that it's water soluble, and uh, it washes off with every rain, which is what you'd want. You wouldn't want a residue of that if you were gonna. I mean, it, doesn't, it wouldn't hurt you, but you, it's hard to sell it to market unless you wash mm -hmm. it yourself. Anywho, um, it washes off and it's not cheap. And I oh, don't well. know, I just kind of gave up on plums uh, a, a while back. Now, if you were didn't mind spraying some uh, and using synthetics, uh, you could deal with it pretty easily. And again, uh, the plum curculio, you'd want to start right at petal fall. You don't want to spray anytime during bloom because of bees, but right at petal fall, that plum curculio, it's a little tiny little beetle and it comes in there and, and starts laying eggs in the very, very young fruit. And it can take a, an amazing percent of your crop and it spreads brown rot. It spreads one of the diseases too, as it feeds and lays eggs, it, it spreads the brown rot. Mm. So uh, if you were wanting to get into commercial peach or plum production, you probably want to contact uh, the regular uh, county extension service and get the spray schedule uh, for that. You're growing it organically, and this is one of the reasons that, that I grow what I grow is because I'm organic and and uh, it's really hard to do the plums and peaches, so I just don't do that I anymore. By the way, we did mention growing them under cover and plums and peaches are two of the things that other people have grown successfully in high tunnels. Okay. So that's that's a possibility good good and i will share um if you did, did not hear all of the trees that i have were not set out by me so they're very very old and i know that my grandfather way of doing things would go to the woods so he would get those varieties that are already growing but he would bring them out of the woods and so I, Definitely, I cannot tell you the variety of the plums, but we didn't have issues. And and again, I always have to think about, and we talked about this on our land, the symbiotic relationship of the land. 
because I yep. am on the land that I was raised on and now I'm raising my children on. So we're, it's a, it's history there. And so, and I feel like, and, and kind of can factually say it, it has a lot to do with the soil, what you have done over these hundred years of all of these generations been, being on the land, it does affect what we grow and what we raise and stuff. So um, I, I'm grateful. I, I don't have to deal with the fruit and nut trees. They, they do their thing, they produce, we harvest. And, and, but that was the goal. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't tell you the variety, but we have had success with with those plums. Um, that is so cool. And this is, I just got to say it, that if this country ran this way, if our societies ran this way, like your grandfather, you know, thinking a couple of generations ahead, of course, we need the, the American, the Native Americans supposedly said seven generations ahead, whatever. If we thought one generation. <laughs> It would help. Yeah, it would help. It would help. And your <laughs> grandfather did everybody, especially you guys, a, a great service. Yes, yes. I, I'm very, very grateful for that. And and that's why I'm grateful to be an act special because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for his teaching. And wow. so uh definitely want to share that because yes, we could do that for the generations to come. And and that's why I, I love NCAT because we teach sustainability and and keeping our ecosystems up to par for generations to come where we're not wiping it out for our own personal gain and stuff. So, <laughs> so our next question is, is fire blight common to plum trees? They have some type of fungus on their organically grown plum trees. Okay. So fire blight, it, it doesn't it only affects palm fruit so uh basically just pears and apples it can get on other right actually you can get on other rosaceous stuff but it's not going to be on your plum it won't be fire blight um mm -hmm. this is going to be something else so i'm not sure what if it's on the fruit it's probably brown rot it's mm -hmm. on the fruit and that's just something you have to spray for if it's on the trunk the tree itself there's a couple of diseases that can be really debilitating one of them is called black knot and it looks pretty much like it sounds really tumory, like tumors on the on the major limbs and trunk. And uh, those, if it gets that bad, you just need to take it out. And there's another one called bacterial canker that um, usually you'll have big fissures on the trunk or the major limbs. And uh, it can spread to other trees. It's not so bad, but it's going to take the tree out itself eventually. There's no good control for it. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. And definitely, um, Guy, could you give your email address now? Because yeah. uh, some of this can be done by pictures. So if you're able yeah. to take pictures of this fungus and email it to Guy, yes. he can definitely help you further. Can you share? Ooh, I love that. Yes. G-U-Y-A, Gaia. G. My last name is Ames. So it's G-U-Y-A at NCAT, N-C-A-T dot org gaia right. dot org oh <laughs> so we, someone have just sent you some pictures <laughs> they, good, i think good. you just did perfect great thank you so much and let's see next question is i have several fig trees they always seem to die off each winter and regenerate each spring therefore they are mostly the same size as they were when i put them out about four years ago what can i do differently <laughs> move further south oh wow <laughs> wow you can make a you can make what i what i would call a real heroic effort and wrap those trees but i, I don't know where that call is from oh excuse me that is so didn't turn that off um there's some people that take those fig trees and uh dig them up and put them in huge pots on and move them into the garage over the winter i've heard of people wrapping them up and and roll insulation you know and stuff oh, wow. I, i'm not going to do that <laughs> uh, and so you know i've got if if people i live in in, in northwest arkansas and uh it, it, you know where i grew up in east texas figs were a dime a dozen you know and yes. uh, just i can remember walking out in the morning uh barefoot and just <laughs> making fig jam with my feet there were so many of them yes. but uh, up here you can make some money off of figs if you 
love sharks. People want them. But uh, yeah, you're just, you're just in the Arkansas River Valley, we can grow figs, but up here in the hills, we can't. So I'm not sure where that questioner is from, but you just, there's a, there's a few varieties that have a little bit more uh, winter hardiness. Uh, let's see, uh, Chicago Hardy. Yeah, uh, Celeste is a good one. Okay. Uh, you can also put them up against a south facing wall and help a tiny bit. You know, because it's going to stay warm. It's going to collect some of the, the heat, the sun's heat. But it, basically, you're just going to have to get get uh, into zone, oh, I don't know, 7B or 8, 8 probably, zone 8 and ah. south. All right, you're coming to Mississippi. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so next question is best varieties of elderberry for the south. Yeah, uh, that's a great question because uh, here to four, all of the all of the elderberry varieties are from upstate New York and Nova Scotia. Wow. You know, so now the elderberry, the native elderberry, has a range from Texas to Maine or or Nova Scotia. I mean, there's just nothing else like it that I can think of hardly. Uh, but finally, a few years ago, um, some people in Missouri. A uh, fellow named Terry Durham, but anyway, he got really into elderberries and started picking out the best varieties from around here. The University of Missouri then started doing some trials and such breeding efforts. Anyway, we now have some specifically for at least the Upper South. I think that well, one of them's from Oklahoma, and that's as miserable a place <laughs> anywhere. So uh, if you'll grow in Oklahoma, it'll grow in most of the South, oh, wow. and that one's called Bob Gordon. His name Bob Gordon is the name of that. I don't know why it has a first and last name. Well, that was the guy that found it, of course. Uh, and then there's another one called Wildwood. And I believe it was either found in Kansas or Missouri. And in both cases, we finally got something uh, in, in variety trials at the University of Missouri, which is not exactly the south, but it's not the north either. Mm -hmm. uh, these things greatly out uh, outproduced, uh, outperformed. Uh, these old uh, varieties from New York and, and Nova Scotia. So mm -hmm. Wildwood, the answer to the question is Wildwood and Gordon, Bob Gordon. Wow. There probably will be some more coming out of this program at the University of Missouri, but right now it's those two. Great. And I will tell you, elderberry is so good for cost. <laughs> so if you're able to grow elderberry, please create a value added product. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're, they're, it's a big deal right now and uh, you can really get on board. They're easy to sell. I'm growing them. I sell them. Mm -hmm. I make a lot of tea and stuff, make some good elderberry wine. Uh, one thing that this Gordon variety I mentioned, th it's the, the panicles, the fruit structure. Uh, everybody, if you know what an elderberry does, you know, it, it looks like a, almost like a plate, like a flat plate where the, I can't, let's see, there's my hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that, you know, and the berries are all kind of spread out there. Bob Gordon holds the, the has, has so much fruit that the panicle kind of inverts and hangs upside oh. down. And oh, what that means is that the birds don't like to feed from it so much. They got to hang upside down too to oh, pick fruit from it. And by the way, I'm already harvesting Bob Gordon. I harvested some this morning. Okay. So yeah, it's really mm -hmm. good. It's kind of bird resistant. So that's nice. Oh, that's nice. Cause yeah, I have the one that goes. <laughs> well, I think Gordon's the only one like that. I think Gordon's the only one I've ever seen that hangs down. I'm trying wow. to get back like there. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. I also would share, I have done uh, cookies out of the flowers. So the elderberry Ooh. flowers, oh, I can make yeah. cookies out of those. So I'm telling you, elderberry, wow. value added product. <laughs> Man, they're easy to grow. Birds, birds about the only problem. Yes, but one thing I love about it, they have spread so many elderberries around the property now. Because they took it from one tree and just the drops, droppings yeah. along. So we have elderberry everywhere now, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to set those out. So, <laughs> okay, I think this may be the last question right now. What about figs in soil with nematodes? Um, you know, I don't grow figs myself, so I don't have experience. I've had okay. this question at Atra before, and uh as I recall, the answer was uh, a try to the organic answer 
was to try and make your soil as rich in organic matter and such that you find some kind of natural balance. That may be a non-answer. I wish I could give you a better one. I don't really know. But I do know that it's a problem, especially in Florida. When you're the sandier soil is I'm starting to remember a little bit more about this case that I had. The sandier the soil, the more likely you are to have a problem with nematodes on uh, figs. So the answer that I found, the organic answer I found was just trying to build up that organic matter as much as possible. That breakdown of the organic matter also off often has a lot of um, oh biochemistry that's kind of suppressive of plant diseases and plant nematodes. Got you. Thank you. So I apologize. I skipped a question. So is the kaolin clay a problem with bees? No. Uh, I suppose I suppose you could hit a bee, you know, directly with the spray and maybe kill it. <laughs> But no, uh, you, and you might make the flowers a little less um, uh, attractive to the bee if you spray during bloom. But there's no reason to spray during bloom. You shouldn't be spraying during bloom with anything, so just don't spray during bloom. Uh, but no, it's almost completely non-toxic. Like I said, toothpaste, kaopectate, you know, it's just, it's just a clay. It's just a dry clay. So um, nope, should be fine with bees. No problem at all. Right. Wow. And it is amazing. OMRI approved too. It's a, it's an uh, approved. Um, it's hard to even call it a pesticide. It's just a pest repellent. Yes. I yeah. always sometimes I jokingly call it the the uh, the Buddhist pesticide alternative. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> you hurt nothing, man. You're not gonna hurt anything. Not hurting anything. That's great. I'm so glad we were able to find that. I I definitely want to do some research on that. K because I've never heard of that the kaolin well, there's clay. only one thing there's a there's a big hole in georgia where they mine this stuff oh That's wow the only bad thing about it oh wow okay you gotta get so it somewhere great. right yes i know definitely so now we're getting well, of course we're getting to our end but keep in mind guy is with us next week but i wanted to unmute um everyone so you can possibly answer I mean, sorry, ask your question to Guy, and we'll give a few minutes for that. So, oh, so not, this is a statement. So the old timers say chickens under, um, wait now, is it the prune trees or plum trees? I guess plum trees reduce the curculo, what yeah, that word? curculio. Uh -huh. Okay. It's, it's a so mouthful. They, He's the saying that the, the chickens on of them can take it, take it out, I'm assuming. Yeah, and that's so the, that's really good that they mentioned that. You just had a few plum trees or chicken uh, or peach trees, uh, which that those are two favorites of the plum curculio, peaches and plums. If you got up in the morning before it got really warm, you can just kind of shake the tree, just give it a vigorous, there's my hand, give it a, <laughs> yes. a quick little shake. Those plum curculios will fall on the ground. They'll kind of curl up. And fall on the ground and you call your chickens over if you got your chickens saying chick 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 they'll know what to do those wow. plum curculio will come around from about right after bloom for about four to six weeks or around you'd have to do that a lot to affect you know really good control but yeah the chickens will definitely eat them and you can promote that if you'll shake that tree early in the morning first thing when you get up for your coffee even shake that tree <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So now if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask questions. We could stay here a few more minutes. You're welcome to leave uh, again. Join us next week with Guy, same time, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, um, and we will have the continuation. We have a lot more questions and start even moving into marketing. Um, and, and thinking about like, I, I'm, I love value added products. So we'll start talking about that. So if you would like to ask a question, please unmute yourself and you can do it at this time. Su Suzanne, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? I did. I just want to know when's the best time to uh, prune my Asian pears. They're getting more, unless I stand on a step ladder in the back of the pickup, I can't, you know, that, that's not yeah. practical. 
Yes. So uh, the best time to prune them would be when they're dormant. And uh, especially to, to avoid the spread of fire blight, you want to do it when it's dormant. Uh, I will say that there's some, some tricks to um, pruning uh, these older trees when they start to get that big. So again, we've got an atropub, and it's called pruning um, for organic disease resistance or something like, something like that. It's pruning fruit trees to promote or, uh, organic pest control or disease control, something like that. You'll find it on there, or you can ask me by emailing okay. me. But it'll give you some uh, guidelines about how to prune so that you don't um, foster the kind of growth that you don't want. And also to help then, that, that will help in the disease control. So good question, and we can help you with that size thing too. So look up that publication. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Huh? Thank you. Any other questions, you can unmute yourself and ask at this time, or you can drop it into the chat. Pull this one. Okay, so can you talk about Mayhaw production? Gosh, you know, uh, I, I really don't know very much. I know what they are, and uh, I know that I've tried to grow them up here, and we're just a little bit too far north. Uh, I think they could be, you know, really people that like them, the people that like them don't, they love them. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you grow them around there, Felicia, Mayhaw? Yes, it, it yeah. is. I I really haven't gotten into the Mayhaw and the pawpaws. Yeah. I, and I, that's just me. You know, it, it is the, the liking is like your taste. And it, it, it's just certain fruit trees that you either love or you like, mm, mm -hmm. I don't know. You yeah. let somebody else grow it <laughs> yeah, and eat yeah. it. And so, yes, for sure, people do grow it here. And um, South Alabama, I visited, and Louisiana, I believe. I think I've seen them there in some of our field trips. Uh, but definitely... And so I guess it's good here, guy, for south, like you're saying, just further south yeah. to be able to grow mm -hmm. it and stuff. Now, do you, so I'm assuming you don't have a pub or do we don't have a publication on the nope. Mayhaw? Don't. Okay. About the best thing I know of, I'm almost positive that there's a a, a southern uh, chapter of the Amer um, North American Fruit Explorers. Uh, I know that there's an apple interest group and a pear, southern pear interest group. I've never seen pawpaw, I mean, uh, mayhaws mentioned in there, but they're, it's technically a palm fruit, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of like, you know, marshy areas and that kind of thing, but south. Mm, okay. uh, I don't know much more than that, I'm afraid to say. I have had some mayhaw jelly that was mm -hmm. exceptional. Got but, you. you know, I always say you can take a piece of cardboard and you have enough sugar and pectin. It makes it pretty good. <laughs> It'll make it pretty good, huh? I, I know. So that may be the reason why. It, so it may have been Louisiana and, and moving down further close to wild. Wow. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. Any other questions? You can unmute uh, or drop it into the chat. Felicia. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was reading somewhere that you needed two elderberry trees in order to produce fruit. Is that true? Uh, guys? Good question. Good question. Not true. Uh, but now this is the weird thing. Uh, but if you if there were no other elderberries around, you didn't have any wild ones around planting two different varieties, uh, you would get a higher yield of both varieties. But even by itself, it would still set fruit. So it's not really true that you have to have two in order to get fruit, but you'll get more fruit if you do. Okay. Thank you so much for the question. Let's yeah, good see. question. We got another one. So could you talk about the newer blackberry cultivars coming Ooh. out of Arkansas? Yeah. So the newest one is called Ponca. And um, a lot of them are named for, for American Indian tribes. And uh, the Ponca is the latest one, and it's really sweet, <laughs> really good. Uh, I, they're pretty much the world leaders, University of Arkansas, and I happen to personally know the breeders, but I don't, I'm not saying it just because I know them. They're really good stuff. Navajo was the taste standard for years. Uh, super good to have a thornless blackberry that's 
I'll say it. It's better than the wild, which is, I know oh. people will argue with me about it. I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> We've got an arm wrestling here. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, man, there's some good ones. And not have to battle those thorns and it's amazing. So Navajo, Arapaho, Ponca is supposed to be a game changer. I haven't tasted it yet. Uh, you know, uh, Luke might know more because okay. he worked in that program at the university. He's an atra specialist. So somebody really wanted to know more. I grow them. Uh, for commercial growers now, the biggest thing with uh, blackberries is the is a pest. A, a fruit fly, a Drosophila. But uh, no, there's some. I, I'd I'd try, I'd want to buy Ponca, <laughs> and we probably will get some Poncas and get started uh, with them. But uh, I mean, they're so easy to grow. Uh, Navajo is great. Arapaho is great. Apache, you know, Washita is a good. Uh, Washita is a real good one all around. You mm. know, good size, good flavor, good yields. If you were going to be a commercial grower, I'd be tempted to say Washita. But everybody's saying this Ponca is going to be a game changer. Uh, you know, blackberries, if you're like me, you like blackberries, you know, on your ice cream, you want them in a pie or a cobbler or something like that. They're usually yeah. pretty tart. I can't eat more than, a, than just a few right off the bush without fear of taking the enamel off my teeth. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of acid on there. And uh, But this Ponca is supposed to be just really super yummy right off the vine, right? I mean, right wow. off the cane. So. Wow. Okay, guy, you got my mouth watering. <laughs> I love blackberries, blueberries, just yeah, those those the little fruit that yeah, you're popping in your mouth and it's it's amazing. Do we have any other questions or a question that you would like to put in the chat? We do. Thank you so much. We appreciate you all because we we love this. We like to answer questions. <laughs> Any experience with the seedless muscadines like rasmataz? Uh, no, not with rasmataz yet. Uh, I, 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 my son tasted it. Well, actually, it wasn't even rasmataz. Rasmataz is 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 strange. Um, you know, I don't want to get into Rasmataz too much because it's controversial. <laughs> it's actually controversial. It's a patented variety, and there's some there's some controversy around it. The University of Arkansas is about to release a uh, seedless muscadine, and it'll be the first of its type. That's that's the the seed, and then the thick skin is usually the uh, the objection to muscadines. You know, from customers, especially if you're not familiar with muscadines. I'll eat almost any muscadine. Exactly. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And there's some, you know, that have come out of uh, Georgia and North Carolina that are thin skinned and golly, just to die for. I grow, if y'all haven't figured this out yet, I mean, I can't grow Mayhaws, I can't grow figs too far, too far north, but I grow a wide variety of fruits. And when the muscadines start coming on, we, it's like we've never tasted one before. I mean, we go nuts. The family, what I mean by we, it's probably our favorite uh, muscadines. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say, but muscadines are probably it. There's yes. one called Summit. You know, it's a white type. Uh, it's just, you know, well, I really, it's champagne color. It's just beautiful. Wow. It's, you know, real thin skinned. You know, and the seeds, I'll say this, you know, I know that when seedlessness comes along, it's going to take over the market. So, and it kind of upsets me because I'm not that lazy that I can't spit out a seed or two. But uh, let's remember that a lot of other seeds for fruit, Remember, I said fruit wants to be eaten, but the seed doesn't. The seed wants to be spread around. So very often the fruit will have a, a, a compound, a bitter compound, pawpaw seed. You do not want to eat a pawpaw seed. It is foul. And uh, apple seed even, you know, has cyanide in it. And, yes. and uh, I think peach has that too. Grape seed is good for you. It's okay. really good for you. So, you know, the grape seed oil is fantastic. But anyway, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you don't want to spit them out, eat them. It's good yes. for you. Yes, but yeah, I don't definitely. know much about Rasmataz. Wouldn't want to talk about it anyway because it seems so controversial. But there'll be more. There's going to be more thornless. I mean, uh, seedless muscadines coming down the pike. Gotcha. Better or worse. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna drop my question in here. Um, you may not be able to answer, but the wild variety of muscadines disappeared, and some of our conclusions as farmers that it was pesticide. I mean, do you have any thought on that? Because my whole life, we always had wow. the wild muscadines and then they disappeared. 
I hate to hear that, but there's a very good chance that that's at least in part true. Uh, so just clearing, you know, clearing the land is going to, of course, be the first thing. But but two of the, of the commonly used pesticides are horrible on broadleaf plants. 2,4-D that was used so much in the south, uh, mm. gramoxone, um, 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T, gramoxone, I'm missing one. And then the new one that was got so controversial up in Missouri is even a, a two farmers shot it out over. What's oh, the name wow. of that stuff? Anyway, grapes are especially sensitive. And there's been some lawsuits where they proved that the drift from eight miles away okay. were wiping out the grapes. I've seen grapes hit with 2,4-D and it just distorts the leaf. It just looks horrible. It looks like a monstrosity. And wow. then of course it dies. So you may not be wrong. It'd be hard to prove. Uh, it'd certainly be hard to prove in a court because of the chemical companies. Of course, of course. Of course. Well, <laughs> that's, the, that's what we lost. That's the one fruit that we lost that I didn't think I was gonna have to plant. And so we don't have muscadines now because this was on untouched land so it had never been cleared and and but it was all on the fence and they're especially so sensitive so if that if that farmer rancher was using and 2,4-D there was a while that it was just everybody was using it, especially corn growers were using it you know okay it's really so, the great you said, it drift. You said, so yeah, that yeah, had it, to be it yeah yeah it can drift wow. and, the, and, and this i wish i could think of the name of the other one you would have heard of it because it's such a it's become a uh anyway it's another one used in in uh in corn production in the midwest and it's probably used in mississippi too so so mr glover says it's dicamba dicamba that's okay. it dicamba <laughs> thank horrible you grapes. horrible on grapes oh wow so we got another question when is the arkansas seedless muscadine being released and um what is it called uh, I think right now it's still just a number. I don't think oh. they have a name for it. John Clark is the uh, uh, the breeder here, and I don't think there's a date yet. But you can bet there's people asking. They're they're oh, wow. That's biting amazing. up a bit to get this thing, but I don't know. Uh, the place to ask. Uh, well, I could probably find out for you. I could probably find out and bring it into next week's meeting. Great. Uh, we appreciate the Clarksville that. Fruit substation at Clarksville, Arkansas. They'd know the fruit sub substation there. Okay. Yeah. That'd be amazing. We we'll, we will appreciate it. Um, right. any yeah. more questions? Any more questions? We definitely don't want to cut you off if you have a burning question. Definitely, you could drop it in the chat or unmute yourself, and you can ask at this time. I have a question. This is Lois Chaplin. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hey, Guy, you didn't talk about apples. Yeah. Um, there's so many. Yeah. And I'm trying, I'm I'm really just a big home gardener and um I, that's I good writing, but um I'm really miffed at the what apple to get. Um obviously flavor is important, but I really don't want it to spend all my time chasing diseases and pests so right I wondered if you have any suggestions yeah I, I do uh i'm going through a you know i'm here in, in oh, where are you by the way lois birmingham alabama uh yeah that's a that's a challenge uh the further <laughs> south you get it is it just is you know there it's we're just outside of the natural range of apples but there is a, a Southern Apple interest group on Facebook, and there's a guy named Larry Stevenson that's Ooh. been very helpful. Um, I, I'm a, I've had some luck and then talked to a lot of these other Southern growers with some of, some of the old heirloom varieties. Aunt Rachel seems to do well. There's a newer variety called Williams Pride that does well for everyone. Both of those, by the way, are very early apples. And some of the very earliest apples and very latest apples uh, escape a lot of the pests. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you might want to look for. So Williams Pride and Aunt Rachel at one end. At the other end, maybe uh, Stamen Wine Sap, uh, Mammoth Black Twig. Am I going too fast? No, I, uh, I got it. Mm -hmm. Rusty Coat. There's one called Rusty Coat. It has another name called Keener's Seedling. Uh, 
there's there's a few um yeah i, I if, if you'll uh I'll, I'll come up with a list or it's actually in our apple pub it's in our apple pub too publication okay okay apple thank you I, I i've got an email i don't remember the name of a, a gentleman in mississippi that specializes in apples do you know who i'm talking about i, would I think, think that's, that's mr larry it yeah, oh, that's mr larry, larry yeah okay yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, and there's, there's, sorry, there's a whole book on old said, Southern. Liberty? Is Liberty the well, other? Yeah, Liberty. Yeah. I, see, it's see summer rots. So Liberty is like right smack in mid season. And if you get these hot, uh, wet uh, summers like we've had here this year, man, Liberty, I love it. It's from Cornell, it's from New York. Uh, so you can guess it doesn't do that well down here. There is a whole book on old Southern heirlooms, but uh, I'm suspicious of the heirlooms too, because it was different conditions. It really was, you mm -hmm. know, the South mm -hmm. was clear. There weren't very many woods and stuff. There weren't very many cedars. You didn't have cedar rust. Uh, and even then you don't see a lot of apples planted around and there's a reason for that. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny cause even in my neighborhood, I walk and I'll see an apple in somebody's yard. Yeah. And obviously I didn't go, check the fruit to see if it had any problems but it looked good from the distance and i thought it well maybe i just was. need to There's ask a, for cutting yes that's right so if you know how to butter graft that's a good way to do it larry's doing that i'm doing that a lot of us are looking around trying to do that exact thing uh i see michael brown on here i see his name i know he's down there in the arkansas river valley and uh yeah we look for things that may not have a name i pick up um some of these old uh, heirloom varieties. Some of them work out, some of them don't. But mm -hmm. uh, and I think, given time, you know, we're really young to this continent. You know, we've been here for I don't know too long in some ways. 400 years, 300, 400 years. It really takes a long time to come up with you know evolutionarily adapted varieties. We can help that with breeding efforts and things like that, but there's nobody breeding in the South, apples that is, nobody breeding apples in the South. Yeah. So we're kind yeah. of on our own to do this, to do this fruit exploration. So what you saw walking around the neighborhood may be significant. And uh, Larry or me, let us know. <laughs> we'll grab okay. Some. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, when at the farmer's market here, I see Arkansas black a good bit yeah it's good it's a good one uh it's got its limitations uh but you know it's 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 from my neck of the woods and i like it and it's real mm -hmm. late super late so it does mm -hmm. all right there's better okay. quality apples i'd say this there was a guy in jewelry let me say this um stamen wine sap there was an old grower in, in georgia is quoted as saying uh a stain he said a fella that grows stamen is a benefactor to all mankind <laughs> <laughs> and i believe it it's a good apple i want my apple to have tart and in sweetness and it's got it man it's got it in in buckets it's really a great apple so that's one i can definitely uh promote so all right it's, thank you're, you you got to pick around be careful I know. That's why I haven't been able to make a decision. Thank you. Uh -huh. oh, thank you, Mr. Mike. Mr. Michael said he is the Arkansas grafted version of me. I am in Spartanburg, South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good. <laughs> I like it. Well, we thank you all so much and please join us next week. Guy will be with us again. And I have enjoyed it, Guy, because it's just growing fruit trees and nut trees that produce, like you say, they are there to provide food. And that's what I love. Definitely what you say about our homesteaders and then moving into commercial growing. Um, this is opportunity just to add another operation to your farm that may not have a lot of work associated with it so we appreciate you so much guy and i thank everyone for joining us so next week it would be 2 p.m central standard time again same link um and of course share with everyone and we also have the call in option so if you have friends and family that may be in rural areas and don't have the broadband please tell them they definitely could call in and listen to uh, the workshop. But we thank you all for joining us and we will see
see you all next week. Thank you so much.